said the right song here. There is a name I'd love to hear. I'd love to sing its words. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I Because he first loved me. It tells of one his loving heart and feel of my deepest love. Oh, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this day and its blessing. We're thankful for the measure of health that we have that lets us assemble here today to pray your blessings upon those that are sick and help them to regain a full measure of their health. It'll be in the court with thy will. We're thankful for your son, for his death on the cross, and for all that, that means to us. We are thankful that we can assemble and worship today in spirit and in truth. We pray that everything that we say and do will be in accordance with thy will that we will be edified and that your name will be glorified as a result of the time that we spend together here this morning. Pray that you will give us the strength to do what's right, forgive us of our sins, be with all those that ask an interest in our prayers, and one day save us in heaven. Father, we ask in Jesus' name, and amen. 429. When all my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, well, through the ages be glory for me. All that will be glory for me. Glory for me, glory for me, when by his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory, be glory for me. Saints will be there, I have loved long ago. Joy like a river around me will flow. Yet just a smile from my Savior I know will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me. I shall look on his face, that will be glory, be glory for me. Let's mark our book to number 593. Number 593. And we'll use that as a song of encouragement. When we think about the life of the Apostle Paul, 
It is amazing to see the things that he went through. We understand he had a very adventuresome life in many ways, having completed his three missionary journeys. We find him coming to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21 and being falsely accused and arrested for something he didn't do. They accused him of bringing Gentiles into the, uh, uh, into the temple. And the crowd grabbed him, drug him out in the street. If some would have had their way, they would have killed him right there. But the Roman soldiers rescued him. He made a presentation to the Jews as he was talking about his work and why he did it. But they didn't want to listen. And so in Acts chapter 23, in the first three verses, we find him being brought before the council. He begins to make a defense of himself. And he says in verse 1 of Acts 23, Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded that they, them that stood by him to smite him in the mouth. He just began to make his defense and said that, you know, I've done what I thought was right and wound up getting smacked in the mouth for saying so because the high priest's animosities toward Paul were very, very keen. And so there are these meetings before the council, but things are not moving their way. In fact, there is actually a plot discovered to kill the apostle Paul. To have him brought down to a council meeting the next day and there would be assassins there to see to it that he never left the chamber. Word of this was given to the Romans and so in the middle of the night in Acts chapter 23 verses 16 through 24 he has to be escorted away out of town and they take him from Jerusalem up to Samaria and there he is held in, in prison confinement. During this time that he's there he has the chance to first talk to Felix in Acts chapter 24. And as we look to the things that he said to Felix, it says in verse 25 that he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and the judgment to come. And Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. And as far as we know, that convenient season never came. But he kept Paul in bonds. And it says in verse 26 why he did that. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So now for a couple of years, he winds up now being left in the prison in Caesarea, wrongly accused, but there's nobody with the right authority who is willing to let him go. And so whenever Festus takes over as the new governor of the area, he was still left in bonds. But the Romans keep making their case, and the, the Jews keep making their case to the Romans about what should happen to Paul, what should happen to Paul. And we find going down to verse 25 of the 25th chapter that whenever Festus has examined all the evidences that are involved, he simply comes to the conclusion that there still again is nothing that Paul has done that is worthy of death. In the 25th verse of the 25th chapter, as he is talking about this situation with King Agrippa, he says, but when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself hath appealed unto Augustus, I've determined to send him. You know, Paul realized that this is going nowhere. In fact, Festus had actually approached Paul at the behest of the, the Jews, saying, well, well, let's go back to Jerusalem, and, and we'll have your trial back up there. And Paul knew that that was a death sentence, that he'd never come back from there alive. And so he appeals to Caesar, because he was a Roman citizen and had that right. And so as a result of that appeal, Festus says, okay, that'll kind of clear my books. That'll take care of things here. I will send him on to Caesar. But he's got to send a letter along, some explanation as to why this man is being sent to, to uh, Caesar. 
And so he asked for Agrippa's help and asked for Agrippa to listen to Paul's case, to the matters that seem to be under consideration here, and to see if maybe Agrippa could help him in writing this letter. And so Agrippa listens to Paul's impassioned defense of himself. And, he, and Paul admitted down in verse 9 of the 26th chapter, I verily thought within myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He said, that's where I was at one point. But then the Lord appeared, the Lord talked to me, he gives an accounting here of his conversion and what had happened. He talked about his going to, to Damascus. He was there to, to persecute Christians. He had authority to put them in prison. And then the Lord talked to him. Whenever Agrippa finished listening to all that Paul had to say, he said in verse 28, Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. So Agrippa was impressed with the argument that Paul laid before him and the truthfulness of the things that he said. And I want to focus on verse 32 of something else that Agrippa said as he was talking over Paul's situation with Festus a little bit later. It says in verse 31, And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or bonds. And then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. I want to focus on a phrase that is used here by Agrippa. This man might have been set at liberty. For a lesson this morning, we're going to talk about those things that might have been. We find that there, we have the situation of the way things really are for us, the consequences of the choices that we've made. We are living in as it was the result of those choices, both good and bad. But sometimes we allow our minds to maybe muse a little bit as to I just wonder how it would be if I had made different choices. What might have been if I had chosen this instead of the choice that I made. As a result of that, our circumstances could have been or could be very different. Maybe much better, maybe much worse. We'll never know. But as we think about those moments in our lives, we were basically at a crossroad. I could choose this path, or I could choose that path. And I made my choice. But sometimes we allow ourselves to become a prisoner of what might have been. We think about the memories and the choices and, and, and we say, oh, I just missed it. If I'd have just done this, if I'd have just done that. And sometimes we can ruin today because of those other memories of what might have been. Even those things at this late date are absolutely impossible to go back and change. But let's look at a few illustrations of how we might think about those things that might have been. Think about the plight that we would be in if God had not sent his son. What might have been the fate of all mankind if Jesus had never walked this earth? There was nothing that compelled God to send his son. But as we're taught in John chapter 3 and verse 16, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. While Jesus was here, he helped us to clearly understand that we're going to be facing a life that is filled with choices. And we're going to have the choice to follow a straight and narrow way which can take us to eternal life, or we can make choices that will condemn our souls. 
in Matthew chapter 7, verses, verses 13 and 14. He said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. God sent his son to die so that we might have a hope of heaven when this life is over. Had he not done that, as a result of our sinfulness, we would all be worthy of destruction. We would be living in rebellion to God with no way to be reconciled. No way to have forgiveness of the mistakes in judgment and the errors that we've made along the way. But Jesus died so that we could have remission of sins. He died so that a way could, of escape could be made for man so that heaven could be our home. But many today will one day regret the fact that they could have chosen to follow the straight and narrow way. They could have chosen to be obedient to the gospel of Christ and to go to heaven when this life is over. That could have been their destiny. But they made the other choice. And they've been on that broad way that leads to destruction. And eventually and eternally, they'll reap the consequences of that choice. Jesus said over in John chapter 14 and verse 6, He's recording the words of Jesus. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we see the importance of Jesus coming to this earth. His willingness to be the sacrifice for man's sins. But sometimes we might need to stop and reflect over what might have been, secondly, if there was nobody who had taken the time to explain the plan of salvation to us. Jesus came, Jesus died, he said there's two routes to choose. But what if we would have never had somebody who loved us enough to, took, to take the time to say, you know, here's what you need to do to get on the straight and narrow way and be able to go to heaven when this life is over. You know, that's the commission that, as Christians, we understand that we have. To help folks understand those two choices, the straight and narrow way to heaven or the broad way to destruction. And it's our job to talk to folks about the choices that they're making. In Mark chapter 16 and going down to verse 15, he said to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If somebody had not taken the time and had the love and care to explain that to me, I might still be lost. I might still be on the broad way that leads to destruction. The Bible gives us many examples of individuals who took that commission very seriously and took the time to explain to others the importance of obeying the Lord. In Acts chapter 8, you've got the story of Philip as he talks with the Ethiopian eunuch. The Spirit sent him down to meet that chariot, and whenever Philip runs up and joins himself to that chariot, he heard, the pro he heard the Ethiopian reading from the, the book of Isaiah. And he simply, in verse 30 of Acts chapter 8, asked the question, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture where he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dung before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. What would have happened if Philip was never on that road? 
if Philip was never able to help this man gain the insight as to what was required to be right in the sight of God, what might have been the end result for that man? Well, he would have lost his sins, not obeying what the scriptures were to teach. But whenever Philip presented him with the evidence, in verse 36, as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. He had the ability now to rejoice in that he knew his sins were forgiven and he was right in the sight of God. He wouldn't have had that option had Philip never talked to him. He would not have had that option if he would have closed his ears and rejected everything that was said. Just, yeah, this chariot, I have no interest in that whatsoever. That can't be what the prophet meant. No, he listened. And so the choice that he made was the right choice for the salvation of his soul. Over in Acts chapter 9, we think of the story of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And what might have been his fate if Ananias had never had the courage to come talk to him. Now, as we mentioned, when you think about Saul of Tarsus, here was a man that was making havoc with the church. In verse 1 of Acts 9, it says, Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus of the synagogue, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. He was a terror. Christians feared him. What would have happened if the Lord would have never had that conversation? He was told to go into the city and it would be told him what he must do. In the verse 11 of, of uh, Acts chapter 9. We find him starting the vision here. The Lord is talking with him. He said, arise and go into the city. Here the, the, the Lord is now talking to Ananias. Here's your job. Go talk to this man. He says, Go into the, the, the street that's called Straight and inquire of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he has seen the vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Now notice Ananias' answer. He answered, Lord, I've heard of many uh, of, of this man and how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that, that call on thy name. Lord, are you sure? <laughs> because this guy was coming to arrest us. But the Lord told him to go, and he did. Fortunately, we find that Ananias had the courage to obey what the Lord told him to do, even though feeling great personal risk to himself. He went to Saul of Tarsus, and as Paul is retelling the story a little bit later, over in Acts chapter 22 and going down to, to verse uh, 16, he recites the words that Ananias gave to him. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul the apostle. And we've been the beneficiaries of that choice that he made. But what might have been if that connection had never been made, if that conversion had never taken place, well, God would have taken care of his people. There would have been somebody else to step into that role. But thanks be to God that Saul of Tarsus did respond and accomplished the things that he did and gave us the scriptures that we can read and study. So much of the New Testament came from his pen. So choices make a difference. And it's wonderful that Ananias made the choice to go as the Lord directed, and the Saul of Tarsus made the decision to change as he did. He later wrote over in Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The word needs to be put out there. We need to teach and encourage others to obey the gospel of Christ. Because with the choices they're currently making, they're going the wrong way. And heaven will not be their home. It will be that what might have been. But heaven can be their reality. If we do our job in getting the word out there, and if they listen and respond appropriately. But let's look at a, a third area in which we could kind of roll that around, you know, what might have been. There are many people who have suffered the heartbreak, the confusion, and the difficulty of seeing their marriages blow up for one reason or another. And sometimes in reflecting back over all of those events, now that they're sitting in heartache and confusion over all the things that have happened, in that reflection, there's sometimes the, the haunting notion, what might have been if I'd have been a better spouse? If I'd have been more what God wanted me to be? If I might have been able to do the things that the Bible teaches I should have been doing as a participant in this marital relationship. A lot of times we look back over those thoughts and say, well, it could have been different. It could have been different. The Bible gives us guidance as to the role that we put into that. As we look to Ephesians chapter 5, Paul talks to the Ephesians. He uses the home as an example of the love that Christ has for the church. And he says, beginning in about verse 20 of uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 5, he says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. That idea of submission can be a very difficult pill for many people to deal with. But he goes on and talks about the husband. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. There are responsibilities laid upon the husband to be the head of that household, to love his wife, to nurture his wife, to cherish that relationship. I wonder what would have happened if maybe better choices had been made back along the way. He continues in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That's the point of this illustration that he uses. But he says in verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So we see that maybe once again, as we reflect back over things, life could have been different. What might have been if I'd have made different choices? And maybe from those reflections we find areas in which we can improve. But let's look at, at another area. You know, sometimes we struggle with our children as they're growing up and, and they're not making the kind of choices that are godly choices and and we began to wonder what might have been if we'd have handled it differently. If I'd been a better parent, maybe my children might be faithful Christians. 
that's another one where we wonder about what might have been. We can't know, but sometimes we can look back and see areas where we did fall short, things we could have done better, and we see consequences that are saddening for us. Now we also understand that as children grow into adulthood, Satan is going to be relentless in his pursuit of them, and despite the best foundations that we tried to lay, they still made choices like the prodigal son to go off on their own. But the job that we have, as is explained here in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, he said, Your fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We need to put in a lot of energy to rearing our children to be faithful Christians. Many folks go through their older years regretting the fact that their children won't darken the church's door. And so we have an obligation to try and be the best influence that we can be all the way through from A to Z. Trying to do all that we can to help them understand the glory of the Lord's church the fitting nature of the Lord's church, the perfect nature of the Lord's church, and if I'm having problems with it, maybe it's me that needs to make a few changes. You know, sometimes we can allow ourselves to, to go down the wrong road, and it's always somebody else's fault. And working in education for, for, for many years, I heard a lot of comments made by parents, you know, and, well, my child's a mess, my child's not this, my child, but, but I just, you know, it's all my fault, I should have. Well, we're talking about choice making this morning. What kind of godly choices should we be making? What should we be doing to help our children grow in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? We can reflect and we can think upon what the past and then we've got to chart our course for the future as to what we can do for our own salvation and the salvation of others, including our children. Or maybe a child grows up and gets themselves off on the wrong road, and they're making one bad choice after another. Their lives are pure calamity. They can think back that there were parents who tried to warn them. There were others who tried to steer them the right direction. But they wouldn't listen. Maybe there'll come a time when they may, might ask themselves, if I'd been a more obedient child, if I would have worked a little harder to learn to make better choices, I wouldn't be in the mess that I'm now in. There is a responsibility given to children to listen to the godly instruction given. The book of Proverbs is filled with wise counsel. In Ephesians in chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. It's an important aspect for us as parents to teach the right stuff, and it's also important for the children to listen, learn, and obey. We think of the story of the prodigal son, as you mentioned earlier, from Luke 15. He thought he had all the answers. He took his inheritance early, and he left and went off to a far country and blew it. He made all kinds of horrible choices as he wasted his substance, it says, in riotous living. Then when the family came, he was in want and had no place to turn. He even envied the food that the pigs were eating. And so finally, he came to himself, it says, and he went back home. That's why as parents, we never give up in the prayers that we offer for our children and the efforts that we put forth to be a positive influence all the days of our lives, we might not live to see it. But just maybe. As Solomon taught us, if we train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he won't depart from it. Maybe he'll come home, just like the prodigal son did. We don't know. But that prodigal son's father was watching him. He was anxious for him to come home. He welcomed him when he did come home. 
even though the older brother had a problem with it, the father worked to reconcile that situation. What might have been? You know, what might have been, the young man may have thought, if I'd have just listened to the wise counsel being given to me, if I'd have never left home in the first place, if I would have never wasted all of that money, living it up and being so wild, what would life have been? Well, very different. I guess he'll never know. But now he deals with the consequences and with the rejoicing and blessing of a father that will receive him back home. Now, in these moments of reflection that we've talked about, all we've done is explain that we're at a crossroads and we make choices. And if we'll follow the instruction of Scripture, hopefully we'll make godly choices that can give us a good life here and eternal life when this life is over. And that we're going to be a positive influence to others around us so that we will be able to be instrumental in helping them go to heaven as well. But we can't live in the what might have been. Sometimes we beat ourselves up. If I'd have just been a better parent, if I'd have just been a better child, if this would have been different, if that would have been different, and we just beat ourselves up with that all of the time. We can't go back there. We can't relive it. People make choices. They accumulate their life experiences. And what we've got to do is move on from there. Learn from what we've been through. See the mistakes that we've made because, you know, now is the only time that we have. From here on to our last breath, we can make a difference and make better choices. We can't go back and undo all the what might have been and live in the fantasy of, oh, maybe this and oh, maybe that. But we can do something about today and from here on. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, the Hebrew writer says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That's the point. We have today. We have the opportunities of today. It may be that there are some things that we yet can set right. If we're on the wrong path that's not taking us to heaven, then there are some changes we still have the time to make, and we can make a better choice. And rejoice over the choice we made, like that Ethiopian rejoiced after his baptism. Because as we look through the scriptures, now is all the time we've got. There's no promise even of a tomorrow. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, he says, for he has said, I have heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If we've not been making good choices, we can begin, even now, to become a Christian, to live faithful in service unto God. And if there's some way we can help you with that, we hope you'll have the courage to come and, and to... Confess your faith in Christ, even to be baptized for the remission of your sins, or to come back if you strayed away. If there's some way we can help you, won't you come as we stand and sing number 593. There's a fountain free, it is for you and me. Let us raise up haste to the brink. It's a fountain of from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you go to the fountain free? Will you come? It's for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call, is a
to help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, let's sing the first verse, number 200. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. We now have the bread, which to us body of Christ. We can partake of it, examining ourselves, reflecting on the love of the Lord and his willingness to go to that cross so that we might be saved. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you sent your Son here to die on the cross so that we through him might have a hope of eternal life. He went through so much torture and suffering. We're mindful of all the abuse that his body took and know that he did it because he loved us so. We pray now that as we were taking this bread, that you'll bless it, and may we partake in a manner well pleasing in thy sight. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We also have the fruit of the vine, which helps us to focus on his shed blood. And sometimes we, I remember as a child growing up, I mean, whenever there was an injury and there was some blood, I was kind of worthless. I was one of those that couldn't stand the sight of blood very well. But in this memorial, we think about the vast amount of blood that Jesus lost as he poured himself out for us through all the scourging, the nails, the thorns in, in his brow. All of that he was willing to do because he loved us so. Heavenly Father, we are also thankful for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which to us helps us to focus upon the shed blood of our Lord. May we partake of this in a manner well pleasing in thy sight as we examine ourselves and strive our best to leave this place today more determined to make right choices and to serve thee better. We're thankful that he was willing to endure such treatment because he loved us and because he was offering for us the way of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Another action that we do on the first day of the week is to give as we have been prospered. There are baskets provided here in the auditorium for the taking care of that. Let's sing the first verse of number 559, and then we'll close our service with the Lord's Prayer. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to go the says the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust. Yeah.